The Chargers dipped back into the free agency pool over the weekend, bringing in Gerald Everett and finding their tight end one for this season. But is it an upgrade over Jared Cook? We're going to talk about that and how he fits in to the offense on today's Locked On Chargers podcast. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Lockdown Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer, and we've been covering the Chargers for over six seasons, but then we're going into our fifth as a host of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. What's up, guys? Thank you for making us your first listen today. We very much appreciate it, and we very much appreciate you guys giving us our biggest YouTube week we've ever had, one of our best downloaded weeks of all time, and that's a special thanks to you guys and having that big week from the Chargers. To make sure you don't miss the show, though, make sure to subscribe to the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and also follow the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from. But Gerald Everett is what we have to talk about today, David, because the Chargers found their tight end one. We were wondering when they were going to kind of attack that. We were wondering maybe if they were going to wait to the draft. They found their veteran guy to kind of really round out that tight end room. So we're going to talk about just our initial reactions to that. How is he an upgrade over Jared Cook? Because I think we both think that he is one. And we're also going to get into, you know, what the salary cap situation is because of that and what it means for guys like Donna Parham and Trey McKitty, two younger, up and coming, but more inexperienced players. But it's also Mock Draft Monday. So we wanted to kind of touch back on that and go with a first round mock based on the moves we've seen from the Chargers and free agency so far. So we're going to, you know, kind of realize how much things have changed since the last time we did a mock. But today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, David, the Chargers found their tight end one in Gerald Everett, and we were wondering when the move was going to go down for them to do something. And we saw how quickly the tight end market dried up. So, what was your initial reaction, and how did you feel about the Chargers bringing him in? Yeah, initial reaction was that I was kind of expecting a move. I was expecting the Chargers to add a tight end, especially after the comments of Tom Telesco basically saying, hey, you know, we're not done in that room. We got to add another body, and that's exactly what they go out there and, and do. They didn't do it right away. They kind of waited for some of those moves uh, for uh, the, some of the other higher profile tight ends yeah. to get signed first. Um, but I still feel like they got a very good value for for the guy that they decided to bring in. A guy that's really going to be able to create, a guy that's still very young, 27 years old. He's been in the league for a couple of years. Um, so he, he is a veteran, but he's still a guy that the Chargers, if he does well, Daniel, they can keep him around for uh, quite a while. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a two year deal for Gerald Everett. He'll be in the mix for the next couple of seasons, at least it looks like. And he's been pretty productive over the course of his career. He did end up kind of losing out to Tyler Higby with the Rams, and he ended up going to Seattle last year and missed Russell Wilson for four games, but still put together a really productive season i mean 48 catches almost 500 yards average 10 yards a catch a lot of stuff near the line of scrimmage for him but when you look at this david i mean really it is the Jarrett cook replacement because that was the veteran they brought in late in free agency last year and a lot of charger fans you know had their frustrations with Jarrett cook who was an older guy who had some really crucial drops made some big plays for the chargers as well but there weren't many clamoring to have him back in free agency and then i think there was some panic when the David and Jokus get, you know, franchise tag and when these other guys keep getting signed, especially to the deals they were getting signed to 10 plus million dollars. And people were like, you know, the Chargers are kind of sitting this one out. They swoop in and they get a guy who I absolutely think is an upgrade over Jared Cook. Yeah, for sure. Especially when you talk about what he can do with in the open field. He is a yards after catch guy, Daniel. That's yeah. one of the biggest things that he brings to the table for this offense. We were, I mean, we were talking about, hey, the Chargers need to add that element to this offense. Yeah, we want a you know burner speed type wide receiver, but that's not the only place that you can go to get a yards after catch type of person. That's exactly what he can do. He is very strong. He's very physical. He breaks tackles. He has that shake and bake, um, and he's a little bit smaller. I mean, six foot three, two forty. So he, he does run very, very well uh, for a tight end. So this is a guy who you know is a very high pass rating when targeted last year, one hundred and sixteen. That's fantastic. And I think the biggest thing is the forced missed tackles. Daniel, eleven of them in twenty twenty one, and what the 
both the Chargers wide receivers had close to that, you know, both their top two guys, Keenan and Mike, had close to that combined. So, I mean, it just, you know, really illustrates very well that this guy can really make people miss out in the open field. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Jared, Jared Cook and Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, I mean, that wasn't their strong point. But Jared Cook, it did average more than five yards after catch per reception last season, which is pretty good. But it was more of a what the scheme was doing for him more than what he was doing after the catch because he only forced two missed tackles last year and Gerald Everett forced 11. Yeah, and then Mike Williams, Keenan Allen combined forced 10. So they are finding a little bit of that here, which is something we were looking for if they were to bring in another receiver, right? A fourth receiver, find somebody who has is a deep threat or find somebody who's dangerous after the catch. I would put Gerald Everett in that category because he is athletic, but he's also physical after the catch. He'll try to run dudes over, right? But he does have the speed to kind of get the angle on guys and be a tough tackle in the open field. He brings those things that Jared Cook didn't. I mean, Jared Cook definitely was more of a red zone threat than Gerald Everett is. Part of that is because of the size. But he also drops a lot less passes too, right? I mean, he dropped three passes last year. Jared Cook dropped seven passes according to pro football focus and it was some really big passes it felt like that he dropped and I think the other nice thing about Gerald Everett David is just you're getting a guy who's pretty consistently on the field five seasons he's only missed five games so you're getting a younger player which goes in the trend of what the Chargers have been doing this free agency period a guy who makes your offense faster for sure and I think also makes you more athletic and just have another guy you have to worry about so I think this is a great move and also getting a guy that can stay on the field consistently yeah I mean I've talked about it at nauseum about the availability I mean so it's very nice to have a younger player that's still, I think, in the prime of his career right now. And, you know, hey, no knock on the quarterbacks that he played with. Russell Wilson's fantastic last year, but he was dealing with some injuries. Now he gets to come out here in L.A. and play with Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and now he can really be that true threat over the middle and really attack the middle of the football field. I think that's something that wasn't really uh, done at a high enough rate last year. Also, this is a guy that you can really get creative with too. I think a lot of his yards after catch came in situations like, hey, you can give him a carry and let him go work. You can, you know, set up a tight end screen and let him, you know, use those, use his quick quickness and his ability to break tackles in the open field. This is a guy that they trusted in those quick, you know, quick passing game situations to get five, six, seven, eight yards. And that's so valuable on the early downs and also a weapon that you can attack over the middle of the football field. So there's a lot of different applications that you can bring to the table. And I think this just allows Joe Lombardi to have another tool to attack the defense in his toolbox. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think with a guy like that, you can use him for some of those gadget plays, but I think he'll also increase his average depth of target too, because I think yeah. part of the reason you saw 10, you know, yards per catch last season was in part because Seattle was on average targeting him only five and a half yards downfield. But Jared Cook, his average depth of target was almost nine yards. So that's a four yard big difference. So you'd like to see them potentially attack the middle of the field more and have a more athletic guy that once you, if you can complete that pass over the middle, especially going up against a lot of cover two Let defenses. Let him run for a while. Exactly. So like hopefully the Chargers, I mean, they did it with Jared Cook, got him into some favorable situations where he had a lot of room to run. You do that with Gerald Everett, that's a totally different story. And now pairing him with Donald Parham is something I'm excited about as well. But we will talk about what effect this has on Donald Parham and Trey McKitty. They're young up and coming tight ends and how this all fits in the offense and how the tight end room is really filling out as well as what the charter salary cap situation is after this, after getting him on a pretty good deal and the needs they have left coming up after them, I'm coming up after this, but I am glad that they were at least able to find somewhat of a premium at that position without having to spend a ton of money on it. But if you're looking for a premium protein bar, the only place to go is built bar because that is the best protein bar on the planet. And for me, it's all about the flavors. It has to taste good. I mean, look at me, right? I'm not going to eat something unless it tastes great. So that's the one thing I love about Bilt Bar is I'm getting great flavor and I'm getting something that fits on my, you know, crash wedding diet that I'm on currently right now. Low in carbs, low in sugar, high in protein. And that's what I love. I mean, most bars have 17 grams of protein, less than four grams of sugar and less than four grams of net carbs. And then you're talking about, you know, you're not getting an oat and honey flavor. You're getting cookies and cream, peanut butter brownie. You can go with the Bill Puffs and get a lemon-dipped cheesecake bar. 
churro bar. Like these aren't flavors of things that are supposed to be able to fit on your diet. And that's the best thing about Built Bar is getting the best of both worlds. And you also don't want to break the bank so you can save some money since you listen to the Locked On Chargers podcast. If you go to Built.com, you can use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, David. Well, there is more to get into here with this Gerald Everett situation because we didn't know what the Chargers were going to do. We were hoping they would bring back Steven Anderson. Still kind of uncertain if that's in the cards at this point because they have three dudes that you know are going to be a part of the offense. Trey McKitty looks like you're blocking tight end right now. Gerald Everett, while being better than Jared Cook, is not you know known as a blocking tight end. He definitely seems like he's going to slide into that Jared Cook role that we saw from him last season in this Joe Lombardi offense. But it doesn't mean that you still can't see something from Donna Barham, right? And I mean, I think that's the nice thing about this is this isn't like a five-year deal. You're getting a guy on a two-year deal, and we'll see what Donna Barham can do going forward because having two of those guys, super athletic tight ends on the field at the same time is going to be a mismatch and nightmare. And also, Donna Barham has only 30 career catches, so it would have been tough going into this season as your tight end one with that limited experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't afford to do it. I mean, you, you I think you like what you have in the room. I think you you see applications for every player that's in there, how they are going to help your offense and what they're capable of doing. I think we want to see, uh, you know, Donald Parham get a lot more red zone opportunities. I mean, he's six foot eight for God, crying out loud. This dude should be targeted a, a couple of times a game. And so hopefully, you know, he's coming back fully healthy. He doesn't have to worry about any of those concerns that he dealt with last year with that um, horrific injury that he sustained, uh, unfortunately. Um, but, I mean, if he is on the football field, he is a mismatch. There's no def- there's no defenders that are anywhere close to his size. So if they're able to utilize him correctly, and even, you know, you saw, you know, Trey McKitty, who they brought in to be that typical run blocking tight end, you saw him catch a couple of passes as well. So I think, you know, just adding another guy to the room that's been a couple of different places that has some familiarity with the coaching staff. I mean, he worked with Brandon Staley with the Rams. I mean, you know, you always have to look at those connections and and those relationships with players that they bring in. So this one seemed like a move that made a lot of sense, but also it's going to be a nice compliment to the tight ends that they have in the room. Yeah, and another guy that has a connection with Brandon Staley, right, going back to 2020 when they were both with the Rams. So from that aspect, it makes sense. And you know from Brandon Staley, you know, what the work ethic is, you know, what you can expect from this guy day in and day out. And it just buys you time. Even if you really like Donald Barham and Trey McKitty, this buys you time to develop those guys. Because, I mean, look around the AFC West, David. I mean, you have Darren Wallers and Travis Kelsey. You needed a playmaker at that position. We think Donald Parham can do some of that, right? But it's never too you know, much to have too many weapons, and that's something that's a good problem to have. And another thing it does is it really kind of frees up what you can do in the draft as well because if you were going into the season with just Donald Parham and Steven Anderson, maybe then you feel like you have to spend a more premium pick on a tight end, and you already don't have a second-round pick, right? So there's only so many impact players you can really – look at in this upcoming draft and say, hey, that guy's going to be a starter this year without feeling like you have to reach for somebody at 17. Not that that would have been a tight end, but what I'm saying is, is it does give you more flexibility there, and it still gives you a you know relative amount of flexibility with the salary cap in this current free agency cycle because it is only a two-year deal for $12 million. And you look at that, David, compared to what some of these other tight ends got, I mean, the David and Jokus, the Dalton Schultz on franchise tags, and you also look at you know what the other – guys out there that we didn't expect to make very much got I think this was a really good deal for the Chargers and it doesn't necessarily preclude them from going out and still maybe finding a cheap right tackle finding a cheap right guard or anything like that yeah no with the Khalil Mack restructure that gave them uh, you know even more cap space that they that they didn't have before so allowed them to continue to add and make moves like this one Um, but this one I thought was very prudent I think it was a very good contract taking a look at some of the other guys other tight ends that signed Evan Ingram signed for one year, nine million. CJ Uzama signed for three years, twenty-four. That's eight million per season. Tyler Conklin, three years, twenty-one million, seven million per season. And you're getting, you know, Gerald Everett here for six million per season. You know, could make up to thirteen point five with incentives. But I think you really like that deal. You know, based off of what some of these other tight ends did um, and the money that they made. I think you look at this contract, and this is another one where you're like, man, I don't think the Chargers overpaid. I don't think you look at any of the moves that the Chargers have made 
this off season and say, Hey, this guy was clearly overpaid. This was a bad contract. This was another quality signing that is going to add to this football team. Yeah, you think so, right? And it's one of those things where, I mean, the more weapons you add to the offense, especially in the AFC West, the better, because you're going to have to keep up in some of these games. No matter, you know, having a much improved defense is going to be so important and just getting maybe, you know, one or two extra possessions per game is going to be huge for the Chargers this season, is going to flip a couple of losses from last year's into wins, hopefully, just because you have such a talented offense. If you can just get a couple of stops, that's all they really needed last year when they were giving up 27 points per game, you know, just like, hey, get off the field once get off on one third down but you're going to still get in some of those games and we saw with the buffalo bills and kansas city chiefs i mean the bills had the number one defense in the league last year and they get into that game and it still turns into a shootout so you're still going to find yourself in some of those shootouts in the afc west and i mean it doesn't you know mean that you're not going to still look to add more weapons in the draft potentially but i think the big thing here and i think you know one thing that's still panicking Chargers fans is just the fact that you don't have a right tackle still at this point you don't have a right guard still at this point and that is something that's kind of been circulating another thing is you know do they move matt filer to right tackle after they didn't want to do it last year so david do you think are you know are you panicking at all just that the chargers still haven't addressed those two positions yet it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable i'm not gonna lie just because i don't understand what their plan is right now i mean you look on this roster and there are a couple of positions on the offensive line you feel great about obviously you look at the center one of the highest yeah, players pretty. at his position was fantastic. You know, he played really, really well last year. The left tackle locked down for a long, long time. You know, you saw exactly what you wanted to see out of that. Matt Filer, fantastic player, a guy that has position flexibility. But, you know, if you are going to move him, I guess this would be the right time to do it. But even then, if you do, who's going to play guard? I mean, right. yeah. So, yes. Is there a concern for me? Yeah, there is. Just because I don't know the plan and I don't, know how many players you can you know sign you know to these type of contracts that are still out there that you can feel really really good about coming in and providing adequate level of play so right now yes i am still uncomfortable because i still see glaring obvious needs that need to be addressed yeah exactly and i and it just goes back to the point i was making about like you want to give yourself as much flexibility in the draft as you can yeah and right now it feels like there's certain positions you have to take early on like right now it's like okay you're hoping a good offensive tackle falls to you in the draft but if not then what right you're just having a battle out between trey pipkins and sam or and sam tevy storm norton <laughs> right i'm just getting all the bad tackles from years past mixed up but like it is a dangerous position to be in because if it is between those two guys that's scary in its own right. But you also just look at the depth, something that you're hoping that the Chargers could, you know, really improve their offensive line last year and then add to the depth this year, right? Because right now you have three good offensive linemen. And yeah, you know, Scott Questenberry left. You don't have a backup center. Right now it's Brendan Hymas, Matt Filer at the guard position, and Corey Lindsley is your only three interior offensive linemen. It's just hard to feel good about that right now. Well, <laughs> How can you? I mean, that that's the big thing is they didn't even trust Hymas to go out there and play at all last year, like not a single snap. And they 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 drafted him, and it just that was the biggest thing for me. I I didn't understand. I mean, if if they were put, going out there and putting out some of the guards that we saw in in limited action and how absolutely terrible they were over Brennan Hymas, then that's really scary. It's like Senio Calamante. Yes, yeah, Senio <laughs> Calamante played over. Hymas. And it's like, was Hymas really that god awful that you couldn't fathom putting him out there on that offensive line? I mean, yeah. is that an indictment on the pick? Or I mean, was he truly not ready to go? And is he even going to be ready to go going into year two? So that's another thing you have to think about. So there's so much the Chargers need to do on this offensive line. It's not complete. You don't have quality starters and you don't have depth. So there is still a lot of work to be done. They have got off to a great head start. They've added pieces that are going to help this team, but there's still some big holes, especially when we're talking about protecting one of the best young quarterbacks in the league. If you want to get the best out of Justin Herbert, he's got to have time. And you just wanted to hope they build off of a year where they really did so much for that offensive line. But you do feel good about Tom Telesco's ability to select guys in the first round at the very least. So coming up next, we're going to be talking about a mock draft Monday where we look at some guys after the Chargers big pickups and free agency. And do we feel like we have to reach for a guy? Do we still feel good about maybe taking a wide receiver in round one? We're going to get into that 
coming up right after this. But I do need to tell you guys about the madness because at betonline.net, you guys have the best place to bet on all college basketball this season. And I can't tell you guys how much college basketball I watched this season over, over the weekend. I mean, it was just an absolutely nuts weekend. And it was made so much better by betonline.net, who's not only the college basketball place you want to be at, but for professional basketball as well. It's the only place I go to place my bets because they have the best lines, odds, and props that you're going to find out there. And they have just a ton of fun tournaments and things to bet on as well. Live in-game betting, a ton of prop bets. They're going to have some prop bets coming up for the NFL draft as well. It's just the best place to go to find the best variety of things to bet on. And it's not just basketball. Bet online, as you covered, for your source for sporting wagering information needs, including live betting, your favorite Vegas casino games even, you're going to find something at betonline.net that you love. I was using it for UFC over the weekend as well. But it's the best place to go because BetOnline is where the game starts. All right, David. Well, we haven't done, we didn't do a mock draft Monday last week because the Chargers, you know, we're making big free agency moves. We had to do some free agency predictions because it was a big week last week. And I mean, the two guys on the poster were JC Jackson, Sebastian Joseph Day. So that turned out pretty well, I would say. But it is yes. kind of nice, Dave, because we are getting to a point where we at least have a better idea of what we want in the first round, you know, or where the Chargers could lean in the first round, given some of the big giant things that they filled, because it's like, okay, corner doesn't seem like as much of a need now, right? Like defensive tackle doesn't seem like as much of a need now. Edge rusher doesn't seem like as much of a need now because you made a big trade for Khalil Mack. So that was obviously really nice to see because that solidifies a lot on the defensive side of things. But if you guys want to get on some NHL trade deadline action today at 12 p.m. Eastern time, the trade deadline or the 3 p.m. Eastern time, the trade deadline is going down and the lockdown NHL shows all over the place are going to be covering it. So make sure if you guys have an NHL team, you check that out in the lockdown NHL fantasy show as well. Ton of big stuff going on over there. But David, now it's time to get back into the mock drafts because it is mock draft Monday. And I want to know who you are taking at 17. We use the mock draft network, the, the draft network's mock draft simulator to kind of give us an idea of who it was going to be. And we're going to switch it up and use some different ones because everyone you see kind of the preferences that they have and how that kind of sways things. Yeah. But I want to know, David, who you picked at 17, knowing what we know now with the big moves the Chargers made in free agency. Yeah, I mean, it's starting to get clearer and clearer, right? I mean, we knew this was going to happen. We were waiting for some of these moves to be made in free agency um, to kind of get an idea of where the Chargers might be going now. And so, you know, when I was going through this, I wanted to go through it a couple of different times just so I had a very good understanding of what players were going to be there at 17 when the Chargers were on the clock. And so some of those names, Garrett Wilson, Jordan Davis, Drake London, Devontae Wyatt, George Karloftis, even Zion Johnson, and of course, Traylon Burke. So all of those guys were all on the clock at 17 when I was picking. But, you know, due to the, the fact that the Chargers still have a giant hole at right tackle, and as of right now, the name that I did not mention is the name that I went up, went up and ended up picking, and that is right tackle, or excuse me, offensive tackle, Trevor Penning. Uh, Trevor Penning out of Northern Iowa here. Guy's gigantic. You know, he's as big as a house, six foot seven, 322 pounds, two sacks, only four hits, and 651 pass blocking snaps in the past two seasons. He's played 18 games. So, you know, he's been a very durable player, and this guy is a very physical player. He plays with a nasty, mean temperament. This is a guy who mauls people in the running game. He throws people to the ground and finishes blocks in the passing game. And he is a very powerful anchor. I think this is a guy who can stymie a bull, a bull rush. He's very comfortable out there. He does, you know, have some issues with quickness because he is a bigger guy. He's not the most agile. I think he played a lot of left tackle in college. I think moving him over to the right side is actually probably where he is going to end up in the NFL. Um, but, you know, considering the moves that the Chargers have made, I like Trevor Penning here at 17 for the Chargers. And I think you feel at least somewhat better about it just because, like, you're not passing up on a corner you desperately need, need or, you know, right. an edge rusher that you desperately need. But to me, I mean, it still feels like a little bit of a reach on Trevor Penning, but he is a guy who has been skyrocketing up draft boards. It just seems like, you know, if you didn't have such a big need at right tackle, you know, 
it, it's hard to say you'd still make that pick just right. because like if you had a Morgan Moses, for example, and even had a guy who'd be okay for the next couple of years, maybe you go, you know, feel like you're really taking the best player available. And that's what I really struggle with. And I told you, like, I mean, it's hard because like I thought it would be easier after seeing the big moves, but now it's like, you know, you still want to take the best player available, but right. there are needs at right guard. You know, even if you, if you put you know, Matt Filer at right tackle, then you still have a huge need at right guard. And do you want to take a Zion Johnson, right? Or a Kenyon green in the first round, get one of the top tier into your offensive linemen to fill that out. When I got to it, David, I had some tough decisions to make. I ended up going with Chris Alave in my mock draft just because I thought it would be a lot of fun uh, for the most part because yes. one thing that Brand Staley talked about that stood out to me was just like when talking about receivers and asking about you know speed threats, he's like, yeah, you know, you want a guy who can get to that part of the field, but if everyone knows that's really all he's there for, it's not really that tough to cover. Find you a guy that's fully a complete receiver that can also get there, and that's kind of how I feel about Chris Alave who's not, you know, the best deep threat and Jamison Williams, I should say, in this mock draft was already taken. If you're doing the draft network, he's pretty much always going to be taken at 17 when it gets to you. And Chris Olave is very low ranked by them. I think he's the full package. I mean, the dude is so smooth, so quick, can also beat you over the top, does a really good job tracking the ball in the deep third part of the field. And he does so much good stuff underneath that. He sets up those deep passes because you're afraid he's going to run something short on you and just make you look absolutely silly and kind of just leave you in the dust. He's a good separator. He's also a deep threat. And I just think it would be a ton of fun adding another, you know, really volatile weapon into this offense, even though you drafted Josh Palmer in the third round last year. Yeah, I mean, he's a pure four three speed guy. I mean, we saw uh, what he did. Four three nine, I guess. Yeah. Right, four three nine. Yeah, whatever. I mean, that it was four two six at one point. But, yeah, yeah. I don't know how it didn't last long. It, it changed that much, but <laughs> explosive releases here to help help him win on his routes. Had a knack for finding the soft spot in the zones. Provides a really good target for his quarterback and has the quickness and agility to get that get that yak that yards after catch that yeah. you're looking for. I mean, he could be a little bit of a better blocker in the running game. Yeah, and he's not honest, super right. physical um, in the contested catch situations, but he's not going to really be in a lot of that. And of course, he's not the the strongest player because he's not you know gigantic. He's six foot one, one eighty seven, but a guy that is an explosive playmaker and put up all kinds of stats in college. And man, it would be really fun. And I think he is a, a player that can come in and add that element that you're looking for. Yeah, I think he would, he would, I mean, really put this offense, I think, into some crazy situations, What just what they could do, like just the thoughts of what they could do if they had those three dudes, you know. And it doesn't mean Josh Palmer wouldn't have a role, but like if that's the best player, you feel like he's the best player available to you at that spot, I think you'd pull the trigger on it. You know, if they end up going with the Jamison Williams, I'll understand that too, just because you're getting that. The best deep threat in the class, you know, the most proven deep threat in the class. So many weapons. It's like, who are you going to cover? I mean, just Jesus Christ, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler. You bring that crazy speed threat to the table with a Chris Olave or even a Jamison Williams. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, that's just it's the aerial assault. It's that offense. that's going to be like, hey, you know, we were aggressive before, but we're going to be aggressive and we're going to score touchdowns every single time we step on the field. That's going to be the mindset. Well, and it's like you're not taking him just because he blew the, you know, everyone away at the combine. You're right. going good just because, like, he just seems like one of those dudes that is just such a solid player. It's hard to find weaknesses in his games. Like, yeah, he's not super physical. He's not so small that you're worried about, you know, sustainability or durability as much. Right. But at the same time, there's just so many things he does so exceptionally well. He just seems like a like a safe prospect and kind of an exciting prospect at the same time. It still feels kind of dirty, though, because you don't know – what you have going on at right tackle. And I think that, I mean, realistically, you know, you'd love to trade down. He's taking a Chris Olave. He might not go, you know, much later than that. If you could trade in, you might still have a chance to get him. You might still have a chance to get one of the premium into your offensive line positions. But we've never seen Tom Telesco trade back first of all right. in the first round. And the other thing is, or ever, but the other thing is, is even if, you know, you want to trade back. It doesn't mean you necessarily have a trade partner. Like you still right. need somebody that's going to want to move up. So as much as it's like, yeah, now you feel good and you want to maybe, you know, collect some more picks because you got rid of that second round pick. Like there's no guarantee that they'll have somebody that wants to move up. And there's no guarantee that even if they do Tom Telesco would pull the trigger. Yeah. I mean, he's never showed us that he's going to be, that he, that's something that he would do, but 
he's also done a lot of things this offseason that we didn't expect him to totally. do as well. So how much of that is the Brandon Staley effect, that, that influence that seems to me is very much there? You know, that could change things. That could change how they approach the draft. I mean, it's definitely changed how they approached the moves that they've made since he's been the head coach of the Chargers. But, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I don't really expect it. But again, there has to be a dance partner, dance partner there. And what you know, what do those trades normally uh, you know end up acquiring? What players they go after? Quarterbacks. And you know, if you look at the quarterbacks in this draft, there's really only you know what two, maybe three, maybe three that you feel like are going to be going in those top you know 17 picks. So I don't know if there's going to be a lot of opportunities to be able to trade back. We would all right. love to try to recoup some of that value that you, you know, you left, you, know, you traded away with the Cleo Mack trade, but it doesn't always happen that way, guys. So no. don't expect it. Well, don't expect it, obviously. I mean, yeah, Tom Telesco is doing different things, but like the other big part of this too is you have to also hope Tom Telesco is different at evaluating some of these offensive linemen because, I mean, yeah. looking back through the draft classes, there's one good offensive lineman that Tom Telesco has ever drafted that's been legitimately unquestionably good. It's Rashawn Slater, and it was last year. So yeah. That's obviously a good sign, but like, if you or if you still have issues at right guard and right tackle, or you know you fix right tackle, but you still have two open guard positions, that makes it a little interesting because it's like, well, if he doesn't get him in the first round, will he be able to find somebody in the third, fourth, fifth round that he can come in and contribute for you right away, or you know, are they that confident in Brendan Hymas? Those are a lot of questions we don't have the answer to right now. But the nice thing is. Free agency is not over yet. So tomorrow we'll be back here with you guys with any of the latest news. Maybe they will go out and sign a right tackle. Maybe, you know, we'll get a little bit more clarity on the situation. But we also can talk about some guys that are still out there that could help the Chargers. That I mean, it's been a little bit slow in certain positioned markets as far as moving some offensive tackles. Mark seems to be moving there a little bit. Maybe that kicks things into gear for the Chargers. And unfortunately, we just don't know if they think that they're okay already with Storm Norton and Trey Pipkins. But until then, guys, make sure to subscribe to the Locked Our Chargers YouTube channel so you never miss the show and go follow the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the only daily Chargers podcast out there. Make sure you guys go subscribe or follow there. And also make sure you guys follow us on all of our social media because we post the show to all, everywhere every day on our Locked On Chargers Facebook page, at Locked On Chargers on Instagram, and at Locked On LAC on Twitter. You can also follow me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogmeyer on Twitter at DrogTalkSD. We've been loving getting into your guys' voicemails and your reactions to everything. We will get into a fan show soon. If you guys want to call in, the number is 323-524-7924, and we try to get every charge voicemail played on the show. But that's going to do it for us today. Make sure to be back here tomorrow with the latest free agency news and maybe potential targets for the Chargers. But until then, take it easy and go Bolts.